Welcome to the Answer Podcast, where we bring you inspiring stories and insights from remarkable individuals in the military community. I'm your host, Captain Manuel Calo, and today we are honored to have Petty Officer First Class Phyllis D. Almaraz from the U.S. Coast Guard with us. As a highly skilled culinary specialist and top production recruiter, Phyllis has made significant contributions to the to diversity and inclusion, community engagement, and leadership within the Coast Guard. As a disclaimer, the views expressed in this podcast are those of the individual and do not represent the official views of the Department of Defense or its agencies. Without further ado, welcome to Phyllis. How is it, how you doing, Phyllis, today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me here. It is so amazing and I just can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, welcome, welcome. I know uh, I've, I've been talking to Lieutenant Colonel Montalban and the ANSO president and then he wanted to actually bring you to the podcast because we're going to talk about who is Phyllis or Petty Officer First Class Phyllis Almaraz and then we're going to talk about your history, where you came, where you come from and then your inspirations to join the Coast Guard and then why you doing up, up to date that you just apply for the OCS and congratulations you got to you got to accept that but we're going to go further okay um but now let's let's talk about Phyllis Almora so let's bring back who is Phyllis Almora Yes so um I am Phyllis Almora petty officer first class um uh, my job in the Coast Guard is a culinary specialist but I'm currently a production recruiter with the recruiting command for the Coast Guard. Um, I've been in the Coast Guard for 12 years. I have a unique upbringing where I was raised in Mexico City and then also raised in Chicago. And after that transition into joining the Coast Guard, I'm really, really excited to be here. Yeah, so can you speak about what was your motivation to actually join the Coast Guard? Do, so, I, you know, you were grown up in Mexico City and then Chicago, but can you speak about what was the motivation to join the Coast Guard? So at the age of 17, I went to Roosevelt University in Chicago for a year post high school. And I just didn't feel like I had a vision or a purpose. So it was a little bit harder to study and focus when you don't know where you're going. Um, my cousin actually joined the Coast Guard first and he grew up with me as well in Mexico City. So he joined right out of high school. As soon as I saw him when he came back home from boot camp, I was immediately inspired by how amazing he like looked, how he reacted and how professional he was. And I never saw that in our family. We never saw that. So that was very inspiring for me. So I actually had no idea about anything about the Coast Guard, but he seemed happy and his first unit was San Diego. So I told him, hey, can you give me your recruiter's information? I think I want to join as well. Okay, so that's, that's the inspiration right there, right? So seeing a family going through, through the steps of joining in this time, the U.S. Coast Guard. So once you, you got inspired by, by a family member and he gave you the actual um, recruiter and phone number. So what was the next step for you right there? So uh, the next step for me was contacting the recruiter. My uncle, who's a Chicago police officer, he was very supportive as well because he helped my cousin through the whole process. And he kind of mentioned to me, well, you know, you're already a lifeguard in Chicago. This would be a great transition. Coast Guard's out in the water. So that was kind of my first inspiration. And then just getting out of Chicago, I, I always knew I had a purpose. I just didn't have that vision like defined yet. But I knew I had to get out of Chicago if I wanted something um, bigger. Okay. And then the process, the yep. process after that was just me being in contact with the recruiter. The recruiter was the recruiting office was about an hour and a half away, so my uncle was always able to drive me there. The couple times I went there, uh, the process was fairly easy and very smooth, and my mom felt very comfortable during the whole time. Yeah. So. so that's good that you mentioned because like something the parents are better like okay so um my kid is about to join the the military service but in your case your mom felt comfortable and let, let you go and do this decision yes she felt comfortable she did a little bit of research um she has the perception of like military so she was like 
as long as it's not like Marine Corps or Army, I don't want you, you know, out in war. She was uh, very supportive of it just because, you know, we mainly stay within the coast of the U.S. So she was very, very happy. She met the recruiter. He was very, very calm and friendly. So she really had a good uh, vibe with him and she was very, very supportive. Nice. That's, that's pretty awesome to hear that your mom was like, okay, so, but every anything but the army or marines I don't, I don't want you to go that route and i'm saying because obviously i'm a captain in the in the army so i know i know about it um but yeah uh, in my case my, my mom she was supportive but supportive but obviously she was like with the precautions like yeah i don't want you to go deep in the war etc so i understand at the mm -hmm. standpoint so so now that mom said okay yes uh you can go and do all this so what's next what was next for you now um, so the next step, there was actually quite a bit of waiting. And I remember at that point, so I did a year of college at that point, I was um, living with my mom. And I just remember, there was, I think I was watching like Oprah, and I just felt very motivated. And I was like, I need to join right now. Like I'm waiting a lot. I'm already fully qualified. So I called my recruiter and I was like, I really need to go. I'm ready right now. I, I just need to get out of Chicago. Is there any Sooner Boot Camp date? And he said, there's one in 30 days. Can you leave in 30 days? And I was like, yes. So that process went from like a six, seven months process and it would be all the way up to a year to like you're shipping out in 30 days. Wow. So, so yeah, you, you were ready to, to leave Chicago. You are like, yeah, just ship me as soon as possible. Um, I want to <laughs> I wanna get out of the Chicago. And they made that decision. Now... Once you got shipped, what was next? So, okay, so now you got shipped and then you went to basic training. So can you speak about the basic training experiences or experience for you once you get to the actual training? Yeah, so as soon as I got to uh, training, it was a complete shock. I was definitely not prepared, if I'm being honest, uh, but I just wanted to leave. So uh, it was... I've never, I've had people yell at me, but not in that way. So it was very much a shock. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. But I always had uh, my family in the back of my head, just like pushing me. And that's what kind of kept me going. You know, I went in there not being able to do like over like six push ups. I was really good with like endurance running. I was a little, uh, I was like a minute off the run. So I showed up there the first week with a lot of different challenges, but I knew in my head that I needed to prove to myself and to my family that I was able to accomplish this because, you know, I was always like the family's like La Princesa, just, you know. The princess, yeah. Every, la, la, princesa, la, princesa, oh. la princesa de la casa, como que. La princesa. Sí, ella es como que, no, yo no la veo haciendo esta. I don't see her doing this. Este, and then all of a yeah. sudden, like, hey, go ahead. I'm just going to basic. <laughs> yeah, so I, I knew I had to prove this to myself. So I was uh, in remedial, sw not remedial swim. I was in remedial for running and then my push-ups. But they really set me up for success and I was really just putting in a lot of effort. So I just, as I mentioned, I just always had my uh, family in the back of my head, just like cheering me on. And I was like, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, you know? And uh, before I knew it, um, it was the week before graduation and I was like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Yeah, that's really, that's really awesome to hear. And then now, what decide, so what was your decision to become a culinary specialist in the U.S. Coast Guard? How does it, uh, why you made that decision in selecting that job? So I actually didn't make that decision until being in the Coast Guard for about a year. Um, traditionally, the Coast Guard, 12 years ago, you would go to your first unit, kind of like get minimally qualified. And then at that unit, you would kind of shadow all the different jobs and then pick what school you would want to go as long as your ASVAB scores were good enough for whatever school you wanted. Um, I, got I got qualified. It was definitely a lot of new stuff for me. It's a whole new world, living by myself, um, learning about the Coast Guard, learning about the small boats. But Within a year, I had an idea of what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be a mar marine science technician, but I was able to shadow them for a week, and I, 
at the time it just wasn't my vision and I just didn't want a job where I would be reading a lot of manuals, like sitting down. I wanted something more hands-on. So then I was in between yeoman, which is admin and culinary specialist because my family all the way back from like my great, great grandfather, he owned a panaderia in Mexico city. Nice. And, you know, my, my grandfather on my father's side, he worked in that panaderia every morning, waking up at 2 AM, baking everything, helping out. So, and then my two uncles, one of them's a chef, everyone's been kind of in that culinary industry. Mm -hmm. So, um, even though I didn't get trained, I grew up with food and I feel like, especially with like Hispanic cultures, like right. food kind of just brings us together. So, nice. Um, I thought to myself, I love food. So I think that's why I want to go culinary specialist. Yeah. So, so we can see a trend in your career path that everything has been inspired by somebody on your family. So we can say that you're a very family driven on your decisions. Yes. Um, and it's, it's pretty awesome to, to hear that you selected a job that fulfill uh, something that you, you saw in your family, right? Like you, you mentioned about your, the panaderia, et cetera. Um, and then that's how you made the decision. So, so now that you make that culinary specialist decision, so how was that transition, like now working for the U.S. Coast Guard? So can you speak about that? Um, transitioning from culinary to recruiter? So, so what's the job of the culinary specialist in the actual Coast Guard, like a okay. day-to-day -day, uh, basis? Yes. So as a culinary specialist, it is very, very, uh, it's a very, very hard job. You have to wake up very early when everyone's still sleeping. You have to get breakfast prepared. As soon as you're like done making breakfast, you're cleaning up and preparing for the lunch meal. So it's just always ongoing. There isn't a lot of breaks, you know. Um, it, my brother, he's actually he was actually a sous chef so he all me and him had a, this conversation of like culinary specialists like we always eat last you know so we mm -hmm. make these amazing meals but we're always eating last but there's a beauty and you know seeing people's faces when you make something delicious and then just bringing people together um outside of that as you trans transition to a higher rank as a culinary specialist you deal with a lot of the budgeting logistics mm -hmm menu planning, everything is essentially on you. So you create everything so that um, the crew is eating well. So there's the nutrition has to be there. <laughs> you can't just be making like burgers and fries every day, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I mean, you, I suppose you could, you can, but I, I always wanted, you know, I had to eat that food. So I was like, well, I want us to be like healthy, but then also like eat well, you know? Um, and then on top of that, you're also doing collateral duties. Um, some of those duties are given to you. For me, I just always wanted to be more than my job. So I always found like collateral duties so I could help the crew. Mm -hmm. I wanted to feel included because the kitchen can get a little lonely when you're just, just you right there and you mm -hmm. get kind of tunnel vision. So I kind of figured out early on that the more I like helped others, they were actually going to help me back when I was like, when something was like crunch time and I couldn't make time for this, they would step in there and help out. Yeah. So definitely it's a, it's a challenging job. Like it's not easy. Like people said like, yeah, they're cooking for the U S Coast Guard in this case, or they're cooking mm -hmm. for the army or they're cooking for the Marine, et cetera. But it takes skills to understand this. Um, not only that you're, you're dealing with food, right? So there's a food, precautions that you have to take when you're making make sure, making sure it's not raw because yeah, you can actually get sick others uh, fellow fellow mm -hmm. coast, coasties right in your case so there's a lot of precaution that you have to, to to do as a culinary specialist when you're making those meals right yes yes there is a lot of pressure so even now in recruiting if someone just wants to go culinary for the bonus I make sure I think it's my responsibility to let them know it is a very, very hard job. And I believe it's one of the hardest jobs because, you know, we are always, you know, preparing that next meal. So while other people have watch and they can take like little like rests or like naps in between, we're on our feet all day. So I, it is a very, very hard job, but I, I think if it's your passion, all that hard stuff is just, it's whatever, yeah. because that's what you love, you know? 
No, that uh, most definitely, and obviously you you will get trained, and then it's mm -hmm. just an ongoing training because like the kitchen won't stop. Like the, the, you you have yeah. to learn how to do this, and then there's a new uh, way to do stuff, and then you you have to continuously uh, learning and 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 be be prepared to do that for your fellow um, coasties in the, your case. Now. Something that you mentioned, can you go back to your first duty station? Now, you're like, okay, so I finished. Well, let's go back a little bit. So AIT. So what was the AI, how was the AIT for you after you finished uh, the basic? Um, and then AIT is... It's your school uh, where you learn your... Oh. Yeah. So the Coast Guard is very, very unique where you go to that first unit. Mm -hmm. Then after that, you go to the, we call it A school. Okay. Um, so the A school was amazing. It was very hard, but it is based on French culinary. So it was really, really interesting to learn. Basically, I had to learn everything because I only knew how to make Mexican food. <laughs> mm, okay. <laughs> so, now, see, so now it's like it's more challenging because from Mexican yeah. food now you have to you have to learn other types of food, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. So we learned all about the mother's sauces. I did not think that it would take like five hours to make a sauce. Like it may, definitely made me appreciate diff different sauces, you know, like even like hollandaise sauce from scratch, very hard to make. So it was, it was definitely challenging, but it was really good to kind of build that structure. And for me, I just was very grateful that I was learning a whole new skill set, learning all about like where cooking like stems from within the French culinary. Yeah. Um, we learned how to make bread from scratch, just different things that I had never tried. If I'm being honest, I never ate lobster or crab until like I went to that school because we had to cook uh, lobster. So I was like, oh, this is very amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so that's what I'm saying. Like it's a, it's a skill that, that, that can translate for your to your civilian and to your personal life. Because now you're mm -hmm. you're learning something very different from being you know, you know only mexican food now you're opening you're opening to other foods and then you can actually mm -hmm. prepare your own meals and back home because now you understand that concept. <laughs> especially with the uh, with the inflation takeout is very expensive so it's nice for me to just have that skill set where i can look at five items in my uh fridge and be like i'm gonna make this this and that and I know this will go well with that. It's it's definitely a good life skill set. Yeah, that's remember that remembers me like the the shows like Top Chef or or Master mm -hmm. Chef. They they need to understand that hey, we need we need to cook chicken, but the chicken is not only a chicken. You need to get all these ingredients to make it flavorish, and then like make sure you, you have the best chicken that you can make, right? Yes, and I would say that definitely translates to real life culinary specialist life in the Coast Guard, especially on boats where, you know, they tell you, hey, we're going to have like 10 extra guests. And you're like, okay, I only have this amount of food. So you're like, okay, let me see if I can find another starch and maybe I can make it a little bit more fancy. So then it'll be a little less protein. So you kind of have to like always adapt and overcome, always adapt and overcome, you know, um, when the seas are rough, a soup falls off. Okay, well, you're going to have to figure out how to make a soup in 30, 45 minutes. Wow. So it's a lot of adapting and overcoming. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good to hear. Now, what was your, how was your first duty station now that you off Chicago, went to your basic, to your A, um, learned your, your skill, and now your first duty station and unit? How was that transition for you? Um, the first one after being a culinary specialist? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was very good. I knew I was going to get a challenging uh, duty station um, because I was going to be the only culinary specialist for about 45 days, which is very rare for someone to get that initially. But the culinary specialist that was there was transitioning to a different unit. So he would only be there for about a week to kind of teach me the basics. And then I would be on my own. Um, for 45 days. So during my A school, my instructors kind of try to teach me a little bit about menu planning. They kind of were, they seemed a little bit scared. And even myself, I was like, all right, well, if you guys believed in me and you gave me this job, then I'm going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So 
So I was already being taught a lot of things that you would do as an E5. So it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a traditional job that you would just get as a petty officer third class. Um, but as soon as I got there, um, the crew had, you know, they were very nice, but they definitely had different comments like, hey, we've had eight different culinary specialists within the past two years. I hope you're good. And I was very confident. I was like, I can make some good food, but you guys are going to have to be patient with me because this is a whole new thing. And it was on a boat. We call them cutters in the Coast Guard, but it was on a boat. So it was an even more challenging um, job. But I essentially learned how to make menus. Just It was very simple menus just to make sure I, um, you know, I thought to myself, let me just start with something simple. And then the more comfortable I get, I can, you know, be a little more creative. But let me just get my feet wet and just make sure that the crew is fed. Um, after 45 days, we had another, we had a culinary specialist second class report and he was amazing. Um, he taught me a lot. He used to work in LALB, which is, uh, here in California and he worked at a big galley. So he had a lot of different experience. He definitely set the standard high. So it wasn't ever like a simple meal, but it was really good for me to learn that. And I definitely was inspired by him. Yeah. So that's a, uh, that's a great to hear. And then did they, so what the crew said after you just like cook all this meal, what did they say back to you? Like, Hey, good to go. Like, oh, they, they, loved, they loved me. They loved me. Yeah. They, they were, they definitely respected me because they were, they knew that I just showed up from a school and I was able to, you know, work by myself for 45 days and kind of hold, hold the fort until my supervisor mm -hmm. showed up. So they were definitely impressed. And then, um, they were even more impressed when both me and the CS2 worked really great together. So they were very, very happy. No, that's, that's great. Like, uh, you overcome and adapt and it's like, Hey, I'm going to be patient with me and then I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this work. And then at the end it worked. So, so that's, that's amazing. And then what was next after that, uh, duty station? So what was next for you? Yes. Yeah, so, um, at a year and a half of work or a year into that station, I started working on, um, I, I finished working on my quals to make second class. So uh, I started studying for the test and my supervisor was really great into, he essentially planned out, you know, three months ahead of like, hey, we're, I'm going to set up this meal so you could get this sign off, mm -hmm. these prerequisite for you to make E5. So he was definitely setting me up for success. Um, and about when I had everything done, I contacted the, and I was on the list to make second class. I contacted my detailer which is like a monitor and I told him hey I am you know I am going to make e5 um, if you have any availabilities for me I would love to go to a different unit and initially he was like well I'm thinking you're you're pretty good at your job I'm thinking of just having you tra take over your supervisor's job because he's transitioning mm -hmm. which for me I wasn't too happy about it but I was like Okay, that's fine. Uh, sir, if you see any other unit that is available, I would be willing to take it. If you could just keep me in the back of your head. And he was like, okay, no problem. I'll keep you in the back of my head. And then a month later, he called me saying there was a critical fill. So that means no one was taking that unit. Mm -hmm. and he offered it to me. It was in Southern Maryland. And I right away said, yes, I'll take it. Um, and it was a small boat station in Southern Maryland. So about two hours south of Baltimore. Um, so that was, so I did two years on that boat and that's when I trans went to independent duty, uh, school for culinary. So that's where we learned all our logistics, paperwork, mm -hmm. tracking, and it's a, it's a three week school where you do a bunch of different reports and learn all that. So after going to that school, I transitioned to go into that new unit where I would be independent, uh, duty food service officer and I would be working by myself. Okay, and then you make that transition from California now from the West Coast to the East Coast, um, right? So you said now you're in Maryland. 
or in Baltimore, Maryland. So how was that transition now from being in the West Coast to the East Coast now? Yes, so uh, my A school was in Petaluma, California. After that, I went to the East Coast in Maine, mm. which I had never, I honestly <laughs> wasn't even, like, I knew the state was there, but my geography, when I got orders there, I was like, I did never No idea. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Uh, and then Maine was where my boat was at. After that, transitioning into Maryland, uh, it was just, for me, it was just another opportunity, another city to explore. Nice. Um, but, you know, the military pays for it. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. Like, why not? And then you, you're exploring. And then, obviously, you're close to the to Washington, D.C. You have other amenities that you can actually go and explore. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm currently in the East Coast. I'm in Richmond, Virginia, which is... Uh, I love Richmond. Yeah. yeah, so I'm here in Richmond. And, and yeah, I love it. I love Richmond, too, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Great city. Uh, that's where I'm located right now. Um, but that, that's why I under, that I, I asked you that question because there's particularities between, you know, West and East and, and you know, mm -hmm. like moving that... Um, now, so so talk about that the school that you mentioned about you learned the logistics the three week school. Now you're in a leadership position, right? Because now you're mm -hmm. at E five, and then you have to learn about all about you know the logistics and the insights of, of the culinary specialist. Can you talk about that and how well you learn that process? Yes. So the course itself was uh, really amazing. They taught me everything from here's how you budget, here's how you budget if you're at a small boat station, here's how you budget if you're on a boat, here's how you budget if you're on a really big boat, and then here's how you shop for this different unit. So what's unique about the Coast Guard is for small boat stations, you know, we're the ones actually physically going into the grocery stores and buying the stuff for like the week, um, which is very, very unique. I think um, on bigger boats, we actually order stuff through a system but uh, it was, the school was, it, it didn't seem hard to me. It, everything was very like hands-on. And we did so many different scenarios of like paperwork that I felt very confident towards the end um, to handle, to be an independent duty food service officer. And then, yeah, and then that's then my next question. So how was that independent duty uh, for you now that you take that position? So it was definitely very, very, uh, complicated. It wasn't as linear as the school because uh, I showed up to my unit. You know, I know I know I can make good food. I know I can like budget everything. So, the within the first month of me submitting my first report, they told me, "Hey, you guys are two thousand dollars in the negative." And when I had done my pass down, it wasn't everything in the books seemed like everything was correct. So I think I was looking at they essentially were like. Uh, books that weren't correct or they weren't audited so uh, that was my biggest learning lesson for me like okay I let this person relieve me and I I didn't there was no uh, deficit here so it definitely was a shock to me at the first month of being there were two thousand dollars in the hole you have to figure it out so <laughs> yeah, I grew up you know in Chicago grew up very humble and that was a lot of money. I always knew how my mom made it work with like $25 mm -hmm. or like $10. I'm going to make a dinner. So I knew I was going to be able to overcome it. I just talked to the crew and I told them, be patient with me. Um, we're not going to have very fancy meals. We have to get out of this deficit. So I just made a lot of things from scratch, you know, potatoes, everything, breakfast potatoes, they were all from scratch. Everything was just cheaper if I just was prepping everything up. And within a month, we were actually out of the deficit. Nice. Which was amazing and a relief. But I also had to, within the first six months of being there, I had to fix two years of mistakes from the past person. So that was definitely, it's easier to do something right. But when you're fixing someone else's mistakes, it's a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. um, and also because at the time, the Coast Guard was the way we would like, log everything was through cash right so if like a couple cents are off then you have to figure out where are these like 10 cents and a penny matters for the government i'm mm -hmm. sure you know <laughs> yeah it does it does <laughs> um so it was very challenging but as soon as i got through that and the command 
um, the command just essentially had the perception of, we just want you to fix it. And that was a big challenge, but I was able to figure it out. Um, it was the crew, it was, the crew was amazing there, but if I'm being honest, the command was because the last set of culinary specialists were very like comfortable and like they would leave at like 11 AM, they would make a lot of like pre-made stuff. They had a bad perception of culinary specialists. So when I showed up, they were like, oh, we have to be very strict with her. Mm. So I basically got like, kind of like punished for like someone else's actions. Mm. So um, it, that's actually what um, got me into, you know, boxing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> okay, that's, that's almost the cue for that. We're going to, we're going to get there. Um, yeah. So as a matter of fact, let, let's talk about that. Let's see, you brought it up. So, so what made you actually into the boxing? Because you said que tú eras la princesa de la casa. You were the princess of the house. And right. now you are into boxing. So, and then we can continue your, your travesty and your, yeah. your travel. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So I got into it because it was really stressful in my job. So um, I was definitely getting micromanaged. Um, and I knew that I didn't want to, you know, I used to just run. So, but running wasn't cutting it for me for like my stress. And one of my coworkers, I knew he would box at a local gym and I asked him a couple questions and I said, maybe one day I can go just to like release like some of the stress because I knew I didn't want to release this stress in like drinking or partying. I just mm -hmm. wanted to like, do it in like a healthy way. So I was very intimidated, but I was like, you know what, like I, I like to put myself in uncomfortable situations. So let's just do it. So I showed up to the gym and before I knew it, I was just I was the only uh, female there for a very long time and I just kept going and going and I didn't really get much like one-on-one -on -one attention or anything but I just kept showing up every day and then after showing up every day for about like a couple months one of the coaches came up to me and was like hey you're in here all the time do you want to get trained <laughs> and I was looking at him like this is crazy like <laughs> I was like me yeah <laughs> Like, I had never gotten into, like, a physical fight ever in my life. You know, I always, like, talking things out. There's never even been a situation where it's been close to that. So mm -hmm. I was very shocked that they, like, actually came up to me. And they were like, yeah, you know, like, they were like, you're Mexican. It's in your blood. You got a nice look, you know? <laughs> and I was like, if you can train me and you see something in me that I don't see, yes, I'll do it. So that's kind of how that started. And, um... I just have always had a pretty good work ethic. So I think that's kind of how they recognized me. Um, but I, all I had to do was listen and follow directions. And um, before I knew it, they were allowing me to spar other people, which I'll never forget the first time I got punched. I think that's when I knew, like, because I think that's what makes, like, a fighter. You know, some people will be like, yeah, this is the last time I'll ever do this. Or when you have that fighter mindset, you're like, I'm not going to allow that to happen ever again. Like, it's a very, it's just like a feeling. So I, the first time I sparred someone from a different gym, um, I remember she hit me, like, pretty hard. And then I, I remember getting really angry. Like, I think I, like, cried a tear, but I also was, like, really angry. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I like, can imagine oh. you're, so, you're so angry. Like, why are you punching me? Like, don't punch me <laughs> like that. <laughs> I yeah. Know. I was like, wow, she just came in and just, like, got crazy and I was like I remember my coach like I was breathing and he I was like and he was like you got this you've been training he, he basically was like overcome it don't let this person take it take this away from you so like all that anger I had to like essentially just like let it out and um yeah I I kind of just went all out and they kept like pulling us both apart giving her like different eight counts and like something came out of me that I had never seen, but yeah, I basically won the rest of the, those, all those like three sparring rounds I won because I basically was just defending myself. I just thought to myself, yeah. I can't believe she did this to me. I'm going to fight. <laughs> <laughs> of course. You're like, okay, so I'm doing this. Like now I need to get all this rage and then like win this. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, and then even, even you won the golden glove. Gloves regional yes. champions championship twice. So that's how far you've been on this boxing career, right? 
Yes, and it was during a very short time. So I think during the span, I was only boxing for two years total. And um, those two, I, I won those two Golden Gloves along with other uh, small, like, local fights. Mm -hmm. But my first actual boxing fight was the Golden Gloves. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a lot of pressure, but I knew I had put so much time. Like, if I'm being honest with you, like, I literally, like, eat, sleep, everything, boxing, you know? So I would finish my job, get out of the office around like from early in the morning to like 5 p.m., go straight into boxing from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., then went to the gym to run a mile and a half and then do my crunches. It was just, then go to, when, if I was back home on the weekends, I was watching fights. I was literally taking everything in just to learn as much. And then of course on Sundays, my coach was like, we're doing conditioning work. So it was the ongoing training where I did, you know, some of my social relationships were definitely like put to the side. I was yeah. still in contact with like my family and mm -hmm. friends, but I definitely cut a, a lot of things that I was like, okay, if I want to be good, I have to let go of this, this and that. Right. So I could, I couldn't indulge as much in food and other things. So like drinking was definitely a no, no mm -hmm. alcohol at all. Even if it's just one drink, no alcohol, but you know, my coach always taught me that mindset, like there's someone else out there training more and doing better than you. Yep. So if you can eliminate these things, then at least when you go in the ring, you're going to have in the back of your head that you prepared yourself fully. Yeah, definitely. And then that's, that's the question I have for you because I see that like, boxing has been a lot of influential to you now. So how has your boxing experience influenced in your career in the Coast Guard and your approach, you know, approach to leadership to this day? Yes. Yeah, so... Um, you know, I, I went into boxing thinking, I, well, just going in there just to like de-stress, but it ended up teaching me a lot mm -hmm. about who I am. It made me more confident. Um, it made me realize that anything I put my mind to, I can accomplish. And every time I have, every time I get locked in on that mindset, it gets done. Whenever I doubt myself, that's when things kind of like take me a couple tries. But it definitely taught me like if you use the tools that you have in whatever situation and just focus, you can, you can do anything in the world. So that was the biggest thing. It built me confident. It, it built a lot of confidence in me. So I think the first bit of confidence I got with the U S coast guard was graduating boot camp, mm -hmm. but that next big push was starting a box. Nice. It taught me about discipline. My coaches, they're both, um, they both are literally like my life coaches. So it wasn't just boxing. They would teach me about, you know, you got to, you know, respect yourself. Your body is a temple, mm -hmm. you know, all those different like kind of life lessons that just kind of I knew, but just kind of hone in on them. Right. And they, they made me realize how um, I guess how special I am, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Most definitely. Like, I mean, the, the, the sport actually brought you to that leadership you know, to your regimental structure because like mm -hmm. there's certain ways you have to eat like you said you have to put to mm -hmm. aside social a little bit family because you now are engaged on this and then mm -hmm. as you learning all these traits unboxing you can translate that to your professional career right uh, which yes. is uh, so u.s coast guard and then that's how you can uh, you can actually merge them and I think it's a great tool for you to canalize all, all of this. Definitely, definitely. And even during uh, boxing, what I came to realize, too, is a lot of the kids that go in there, you know, they go in there because they're, let's say, they're, like, fighting at school or they're going through hard times at home. So me being in that gym, it went from me being the only woman to, like, we had a wim all women's class, and I was helping coach that class, which was amazing. Um, so just going through those different ones, it kind of helped, it kind of just made me realize, like, it's also bigger than me, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in there helping other people out, whatever they have going at home, they're letting it out here in boxing, even if it's not competing. I had, um, uh, mentored this one, um, boxer where she was actually in the program for like the Navy JROTC mm -hmm. where you like finish high school and then they 
take they pay for you to go to college i believe yes or something like that yeah. mm -hmm. and uh me and her would train together you know i would try to like mentor her as much as possible i would be there for her and um you know she graduated went off to college so that was amazing for me to see along with there was a lot of spanish speakers who started to show up mm. so um i had a you know i was there just translating for them um, I had a, my coach was trying to communicate with the parents, you know, because a lot of times the parents want to get involved and coach their kids. Okay. Um, and my coach was like, no, like they can't, like they need to just, um, they can watch, but they need to respect, like I'm teaching them this way, you know? Gosh. So I had to translate and also build relationship with those parents. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of the times they would be so like happy that I was there to help them out. I helped them register for the kids to get like their booklet so they could actually fight so the mom she was always like come on over for food mija like she would have like tortillas carne asada and everything so it was really nice for me to see that and you know those are moments where i'm just like wow that felt so good just to like help uh help you know the whether it's like i'm uh having younger the younger woman and the uh, Navy JROTC or just being a translator for those families so they could get that opportunity to box. Yeah, so that's a lot of community engagement that you create and also you see so no, you don't also think about you and your your career as a boxer now and the U.S. Coast Guard but now you're engaging other, uh, the community with these experiences and mentorship and, and that's great to hear because like um, that's how you, you can get translate to the community like, hey, this is me. I'm a U.S. Coast Guard. I work for them, but I also do boxing and I maintain my engagement with the community. Now, can you speak about like now the transition from culinary specialist to recruiting? So how, how, how did that happen to you? And, and can you speak about that? Yes. So I was I actually um, after finishing out Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, usually when you finish out in a unit that's not a boat, you get a lower rank and like what you're going to get. So you're probably not going to get the best of the billets. Mm -hmm. but you won't have a priority essentially as the other people that are on boats. So um, I actually applied for the command aid in DC and, you know, me and my senior chief worked really hard to get my package set up and we were pretty confident that I was going to get it which the command aid for the Coast Guard is essentially you can work in like the White House or the DHS and you kind of help like you make food for like admirals mm -hmm. and special events mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I was very excited about that. My senior chief, he was amazing. So I went from having a leader who wasn't that great to like a leader who was amazing. He was just like <laughs> the and dad. Night. Day and night, <laughs> right? Day and night. Yeah, yeah, he was literally a lot of like <laughs> my light. I was like, oh, I'm so mad I didn't have you for three years. But he was so great. Um, and he loved uh, cooking. So he would be like, oh, I saw this on the show. Do you think we can make this? Like, And I was like, well, I've never made a potato like that. It was literally like the things he was showing me were like amazing. Like mm -hmm. a fondant potato, which is essentially you have to like cut a potato in like a perfect square. You like steam it. So when it comes out, it's just like a buttery, it has like a sauce on top. Mm -hmm. He just like taught me a lot of different things. So even though he wasn't a culinary specialist, he was a bosun's mate. He was definitely like mentoring me and helping me. So I applied for that. Um, I was pretty set on. I was like, there's no way I'm not going to get this. You know, I'm pretty confident. And then I had a call I got a call saying hey unfortunately you did not get selected but thank you for trying so that was mm -hmm. like I was very very sad mm -hmm. but I was like all right well I'm probably gonna get a bad um pick but that's okay so I called my detailer and my detailer he was in contact with me because I he knew I was gonna I applied for the command aid he knew I boxed he knew a little bit about him I'd never met him in person but I called them and I was pretty sad and he was like, all right, Almaris, I understand you're pretty sad. He was like, but do you remember at the top of your head what was your number one pick if you weren't going to get this? And I was like, yeah, it was the, the Haddock, which is the name of the cutter here in San Diego. And he was like, okay. He was like, well, I want to let you know that um, I actually held this billet, saved this billet for you just in case you weren't going to get selected. And it's about a 90% chance you're able to go there. The only thing is right now it's a male only boat. 
but they can transition into a male female uh, boat it would just mean that it would be you and another female coming from boot camp are you going to be okay with that and i was shocked i was like i can't believe he's so nice like why is he like why is he being so kind to me because this is really unheard of mm -hmm. um but i think just because he knew i was working really hard in maryland and i was you know shooting for the stars with command aid he just took it out of him to help me out and i think that was my first like my first experience in the coast guard where someone just really went out of the way to help me out and the reason i put that boat was because my cousin that was his first boat when he joined the coast guard so i kind of put it in there it's called the dream sheet so i put it on there it said male only but I still put it on there because I was like, you know, it's a dream sheet. I can dream. I'm going to put it on there. So I ended up getting it. And that's how I got to San Diego. <laughs> nice. And I yeah. San Diego back in, in the West Coast. That's where you're at located right now. So mm -hmm. and then um, like when I was reading to your bio, it says uh, you've been recognized as the top production recruiter in the U.S. Coast Guard. So can you explain like, what, what that entails and then what strategies do you implement implemented to achieve this recognition? Yes. Yeah, so uh, within my first year of recruiting, it was definitely something brand new, but I knew that I wanted to try something new and be good at it. Um, some of the things I implemented was I created my own recruiting Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I also, as, when I reported to the unit, I asked if I could also take over their Instagram. Um, just because I told them, you know, like everyone's on social media now and it kind of gives us a bigger footprint. And it's also a tool where we can kind of show off who graduated, some of the people that succeed. And then also a little bit about the process, because the truth is not a lot of people know about the Coast Guard. So I still go to a lot of events where people are like, what's the Coast Guard? Mm -hmm. uh, because we've never really been, you know, we're not recruiting like we've we've traditionally haven't been recruiting kind of like the other military services where we're on commercials and stuff like that. Yeah, we have a couple movies, but our footprint hasn't been as big. So the first thing I implemented was getting involved with social media, um, also taking over the Google account where, you know, everyone that had a good experience, I would ask them if you feel comfortable to just write an honest review. Mm -hmm. Because I know for myself, whenever I go somewhere, I look at the reviews. <laughs> so that was the first thing. Um, also, just uh, honestly, just caring and listening to everyone, you know. Um, it was really hard for my brother to join the Coast Guard in Chicago. So I came into recruiting knowing I'm going to get my brother in the Coast Guard, whether it's some other recruiter in another office or me myself. So he actually ended up getting recruited out of my office in san diego so wow. <laughs> that's amazing um now they obviously the everything is is managed or not managed but like tunneled through social media so uh, like everyone has to have a presence in social media because now that's how we interconnect one each other and then most definitely like as you approaching to your recruiting office it's like hey let's let's put more uh work to social media so we can engage with the younger generations because like that's how they're connecting right now right instagram facebook tiktok and now um youtube etc in the matter of fact mm -hmm. this is a this is what we're doing right now right a yeah. podcast yeah. that we're going to broadcast in youtube um raising awareness in this especially in this particular case ANSA, right the association mm -hmm. of naval service officers we will speak in a moment about that and okay and then the next thing for you so you apply for the ocs or officer candidate school so what made you actually apply for that? What was your motivation to actually do do so? And then you you did get selected too, so. Yes, yes. So my first, I always had looked up to officers, but I knew in my head, I was like, oh, I don't think I can be an officer because I'm already enlisted. So it was definitely like the lack of knowledge. Um, I had talked to a person, I think when I was on the boat in San Diego about um, being an officer, but she told me, oh, you know, you're too old to be an officer or you have too much time in, in the Coast Guard to be an officer. And I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. But, you know, looking now looking at it, I think she was 
uh, speaking of, about another program, there's a lot of different officer programs. So um, through recruiting, uh, when I was on the boat, I actually got a phone call from a lieutenant asking for a culinary specialist at a essentially to go to El, El Paso, Texas and kind of look at different schools because they were looking into possibly opening up a new recruiting office. And he was just, I think he was just calling different culinary specialists that were available. I, I had never met him. But um, when he called, I was like, wow, this is an awesome opportunity. I've never done something like this. So um, at the, my command was very supportive and it was during a time where a boat wasn't out at sea. So that's actually how I got into, I guess, learning about recruiting. I went there and talked to many different schools, kind of told my story, connected with a lot of people. And at that event, at, at that week of El Paso, the captain at the time for Coast Guard Recruiting Command was very impressed with me. And he told me, you know, you should really think about applying to be a recruiter. And that was really never in my head as something I would want, but it just felt so natural when I was talking to those kids in El Paso mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, I was like, I think I am gonna apply for recruiting. So, I think I forgot what was the last question. I kind of yes. Yeah, so so <laughs> about yeah, it's okay. So about OCS. So oh yeah, the motivation yes. of OCS and you get actually selected. So so what was the process? Uh, it was is a packet that you had to put in, and then like you got selected. And can you speak about yes. that? Yeah. Yes. So one of my friends, uh, Joshua Rydell, he was a petty officer second class. He actually I met him through this El Paso trip, and he is a he competes in jujitsu, so we both have had that same. Um, we both love com combat sports, so that's how we started being friends. And uh, he was in the process for applying for OCS, and when he found out how much I was doing with different programs, I was, uh, you know, affiliated with. He was like, "You should do OCS." He was like, "You do all these different things. You would make a great officer." And I said, "You know, unfortunately, I don't think I qualify for it." And he was a recruiter at the time. And he was like, what are you talking about? You do qualify for it. And he like sent me the manual, sent me everything. So it, it really sprouted from him basically like, you know, giving me that knowledge of you do qualify for it. So at one year of recruiting, that's where I decided, okay, let me start working on my package. Mm -hmm. um, on the first year of recruiting, I was being, uh, people were telling me to apply then but I'm the kind of person where I really want to get good at something before I depart it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, after that first year, that's where I started working on my package for OCS. It definitely was, I knew that if I wanted to do a package, I wanted to put everything into it. So definitely with this package, um, it helped that, you know, the chief in my office, Chief Berrios, she helped me with, okay, this is what you're going to need, get this, this, and this done and every little step. So because I started working at it about like eight months before the actual package was due, it definitely, um, by the end when I submitted it, I felt very comfortable and like, you know, I put everything in this package and even if I don't get selected, it's just such an amazing experience to even apply. Like I never thought I would be able to. So just the application process was really just like a dream for me. And nice. even my mom, she was so happy. Yeah, so uh, congr congratulations, because that's a huge step in the career, right? So now becoming an officer um, after you, you've been so many years in the U.S. Coast Guard, now you're going to transition to be uh, in the leadership ranks. Um, now, you mentioned somebody, Chief Barrios, right? So she is with Ansel, right? Yes. So, so let's speak about Ansel, because I know you're very engaged on mentorship. Like we mentioned, uh, high schoolers. Uh, etc. So throughout your boxing career and even your own career, but let's speak now of professional, you know, um, mentorship and how Anso can help shape this this mentorship. Yes. So Anso was actually an event that Chief Berrios invited me to, and she was like, "You're gonna love it," you know. And I told her, "You know what? I have never been to anything with Anso. I've been to NNOA, you know, different different um, symposiums, but." she really was pushing for me to attend and I was able to go and within the first day of being there, I honestly, it was very emotional for me because I felt like I finally found like my people, you know, 
and just hearing people's different paths and, you know, how a lot of people were going from illicit to officer, it was amazing for me because I had never seen that. Um, so that first uh, Ansel Symposium I went to was very, very emotional for me. Um, seeing all these amazing, like, female Marines going from, like, E1 all the way to, like, warrant officer or officer, or you know, so it was just very inspirational. But I do remember at the end of that, I called my mom and I was like, mom, like, yeah, ya encontré nuestra gente, ya encontré donde estaban, like, they were in Anso. Mm. And yeah, it was just very emotional for me. Nice. And she was, she was really happy. She was like, I can't believe there's groups like this. And um, so that's why I'm very close to it. So it just, it just, I, I wish I would have found out about you guys sooner, but it's good that we're making this podcast because more people will find out yeah, about it. Yes. But I definitely, um, I definitely felt very close after that first uh, symposium. And I was like, this is an event that I would, no matter what, if I'm able to put everything to the side to make it to these events. Yeah. This, it, it was such a big impact on me. Yeah, that's great to hear because that's uh, what the ANSO is built for, to bring up bringing all the community, the community together, the Hispanic. I know they're spending for more inclusive, not only Hispanic, but but other communities can join. But it's great mm -hmm. that you, you feel that connection and, and seeing people that you can relate to because like, hey, um, you're not alone in this career. There's multiple, um, this example, Latinos, right? Mm -hmm. With similar traits that you can relate to and then they're basically um, facing the same challenges that you are, um, et cetera. But that's great for answer, which that reminds me for the listeners, uh, the upcoming symposium for ANSO is coming up uh, this 29th of July through 2nd of August, or August the 2nd, 2024, is going to be held at the Marriott Waterside Norfolk Hotel in Norfolk, Virginia. It's going to be the East Side Symposium. Um, this is the Joint Leadership and Professional Development Symposium. Uh, and it is in conjunction with the NNN. -N 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 NNOA, uh, that's uh, the Naval, the National Naval Officers Association, in conjunction with the Association of Naval Service Officers, which is the ANSA, which is upcoming. More than welcome if you're east side. I know the west side is uh, is coming up soon, so we'll more to follow for information once the symposium is for the west side. Um, Phyllis, it's been it's been a travesty. Like your 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 career has been great to hear like all your ups and downs and how you became like from being a 17 years old, inspire, inspire for your family member to join the Coast Guard until now that you're up to uh, be a second lieutenant soon in the, in the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, to be to closing out now the, the podcast, so what are your long-term career goals within the Coast Guard for you right now? So uh, my long-term goals is to obviously graduate OCS, become, become an amazing officer, help others, and then just see how far I can get with the Coast Guard. So I do want to mention Lieutenant Colonel Montalban. So he has been a great mentor for me. And he's another person where me and him have a lot of like the same upbringing. So I'm definitely motivated by him. But I knew when I joined the Coast Guard that I was going to do 20 years. But now I'm at the point where it's like, if I'm still feeling good at 20, I'll definitely do more. But I definitely want to just go as far as I can with my officer career. Um, and then, yeah, that's, that's, those are my big long-term goals. I definitely want to keep pushing Anzo and make it bigger and bigger mm -hmm. just because, you know, I feel like everyone needs to hear about it in all branches. Yeah, that's great. And then last question before we close out. So any advice for the listeners right now, they're looking to join any of the military services. What would you give an, an advice that to push them over the edge to join any military service? Yes, so uh, I definitely want to say that the perception I had at 17 years old of all the branches is definitely different of what the reality is. You can still be who you are. You can still be yourself and still be in the military. In fact, you're able to do that a little bit more because you have a pay every, every the first and the 15th, you're always going to get paid. You have health care. You have benefits. You can help your family. Um, so 
get out of that perception that you're actually just attached to like a contract or like owned by the government. No, you're actually being helped out, getting a lot of benefits and you can definitely, you know, just finish your four years or go as big as you want to. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Yeah. So most definitely you hit, hit the nail on the head. Um, don't be afraid. Just ask questions, do your research. Um, there's many uh, service members and uh, out here in the, all the military services that at, at the beginning, they have their doubts and why not? Like I mentioned, when I joined the army, I was like, yeah, I want to join the army, but I don't want to go to war. Yeah. Uh, because that's the first perception, but you need to understand mm -hmm. that the army or the, the military branches is like a, any other, you know, organization. This is structured. Mm -hmm. You have your exact job that you will do. Like, for example, Phyllis it was a culinary specialist in one point of the career. And then I am a logistics officer. So we have role, roles to fulfill like any other organizations mm -hmm. out there. Well, Phyllis appreciated the time i know it's early in in cali <laughs> but appreciated the time here in saturday um i do want to uh, say thank you from from myself and from the ansa community and, and the ansa podcast appreciate it being here it was amazing to hear your story throughout uh the, your entire career thank you so much and i will see everyone at the upcoming nnoa ansa symposium yeah, and then I'm going to close out. Thank you again, uh, Phyllis, you. for sharing uh, your incredible journey and insights with us today. Your dedication to service, leadership, and community is truly inspiring. We wish you all the best in your uh, future endeavors, especially uh, in OCS. Thank you for the listeners uh, that tune in into the Answer Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review. Stay tuned for more inspiring stories from the military community. Until next time, stay safe and stay, stay inspired. Let's go.